Hello again and welcome back to our whirlwind tour through the Bible. We've made it to the prophetic literature. Dr. Gary Statz is with us again today. And um, this should be an interesting next couple sessions here as we look through the prophets. Um, in our last session, we looked at Solomon. We looked at the wisdom literature. And I mentioned that the time of David and Solomon was the golden age of Israel. Uh, it did not stay the golden age for long. What happened after Solomon's reign? Well, basically, what happens with Solomon is that he began to marry women from other uh, places who brought in their gods. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result, the Golden Age began to be uh, diminished because of the gods coming in. And as we look at what happened subsequent to that, I mean, all of these different gods, and especially Baal, Baal, became dominant. And so you would have to say that the tragedy <laughs> had to do with his marrying and intermarrying with non-Israelite uh, women, and the result was tragic in terms of the idolatrous situation, uh, Rob, that developed. And then Israel as a nation even went through a, a crisis as a result, and they, <coughs> they end up being two different kingdoms. Absolutely. Under Rehoboam and Jeroboam, uh, there was a split when the younger folk told Rehoboam to go ahead and raise the taxes. So there was the split over taxes back then, really. And uh, Jeroboam the first then went uh, apart from the southern kingdom and established the northern kingdom at uh, Dan. And uh, the result was that there was this great divide and you had the kingdom of the north and the kingdom of the south. And the kings of the north, not one of them is commended in the book of Kings. They're all negative. Uh, there was a prosperous time during Jeroboam the second and his time in Second Kings chapter 14. But as far as being commended, they left the central place of worship, which was Jerusalem. And in Deuteronomy, that was to be where Israel was to have the center place of worship. And then they established idolatrous practices uh, in the northern kingdom. So not one king in the north is, com is commented upon in a positive way. The northern kingdom endured until 722 BC when the kingdom of the north was defeated by Sargon II uh, from Assyria. And you find this in 2 Kings chapter 17. And so this divided kingdom starting in 1 Kings 12 goes to 2 Kings 17. And then you have a surviving kingdom from 2 Kings 18 to the end of 2 Kings. And that's Judah mm. alone. At the same time, the writer of uh, Kings or the authors of Kings will show that you had the northern uh, kings, then you had the southern kings, and they will be back and forth. I mean, the way he writes. Uh, a number of them were bad as well, many of them. You had a few wonderful moments of revival. For example, among Hezekiah, mm -hmm. you had that in Second Kings 18 through 19. Uh, you also had it during the time, uh, you know, a little bit later, uh, Josiah's time. But basically, a lot of them were spoken of in negative light because of bringing in idolatrous worship. But the North, all of them, <laughs> were involved in the worship of Baal, Baal, or other idols. And the northern kingdom disappeared from history when the ten tribes of the north were dispersed when Assyria came in. 
And I might say uh, those are lost tribes as far as kings is concerned. And at the same time, the Assyrian approach was to leave some folk there and bring in other peoples and they intermarried. And this will account for the Samaritans mm -hmm. that we'll hear about later in the biblical narrative and the dislike mm -hmm. of the Jewish element of the Jewish people toward the Samaritans. They felt they were, uh, you know, a, a people that would not be as they were. And so there was a conflict constantly. And so in the divided kingdom, I think, just to clarify, we often use the word Israel for the northern kingdom and Judah for the southern Ex kingdom. <laughs> exactly. That's often used. Uh, Israel, Ephraim for the northern kingdom, Judah, uh, Judah for the southern kingdom. And uh, the writer intertwines, or the book intertwines both, okay. sort of back to back. Uh, but I think his purpose, if I could just say a word about mm -hmm. the purpose of kings, I'm thinking the purpose is to share why, the why of the captivity, mm -hmm. the why of the Babylonian captivity. So it's a theological book yes. as well. Uh, the historiography, the history part is history, but it's history being used also to teach a theological yeah. message. I think, the why of the captivity, whereas Chronicles, as we'll see later, is after the captivity, going through uh, some of the same material, especially with the southern mm. kingdom and David, because there the purpose is to encourage the rebuilding of what David started, mm -hmm. and uh, the rebuilding of the temple, and the temple worship, and so mm -hmm. forth. So and to continue the revivals. So the two had, the one would be post-exilic, helping the folk at that point in their project of rebuilding the land after coming back from Babylon, back mm -hmm. to the Promised Land, where I think Kings is defining, can we say, the reason for the captivity. Just a little overview of uh, the kings and uh, how important that book is. Well, because there were no good kings in the northern kingdom and few good kings in the southern kingdom, after those golden days, it was a very bleak picture in Israel. And because the kings were <laughs> the leaders mm -hmm. of God's people and they were bad, God found another way to speak to his people. He spoke to the kings mm. and he spoke to the people through these people that we know as prophets. Mm. Um, and yet, as Jesus said, they were often killed. Uh, so there's an interesting dynamic if you're, a, if you're a prophet or if you were living as a faithful Israelite in Israel these days. Yeah, uh, their message Actually, the word prophet, Navi, Nevi'im, becomes one of the headings of the Hebrew uh, scriptures. But a prophet was one who spoke for God, a Navi. Mm -hmm. And their goal was to bring people back to the Torah and to issues such as proper worship rather than religious ritual, uh, issues such as justice issues, mm -hmm. like in Amos. Mm -hmm. And so they mainly were trying to bring the people back to the Torah. At the same time, many of them spoke about the future, about Messiah, Mashiach, and what the Lord would do and how he would deliver them uh, into the enemy, but then bring them back and bring a Messiah someday that would come. So, but their message at times was very unpopular, as you've said. Uh, I think of Amos calling the ladies at, uh, of the northern kingdom cows of Bashan. I mean, you don't win too many people <laughs> and influence too many of them at that point. Yeah. So, so basically, they had hard messages, mm -hmm. all of them. And especially when you think about uh, Jeremiah, 
telling the people to pack your bags, you know, we're going to Babylon, or uh, Ezekiel in Babylon saying, hey, you know, uh, our people are going to have to come here because of apostasy and disobedience. So, and they were addressing issues of idolatry. We'll, we're going, we'll see that, for example, with uh, Elijah and uh, Baal, Baal and those issues. So, yes, they, they suffered because they spoke hard things. I've often wondered if a pastor would speak like <laughs> a prophet. I don't know how long that they would have their church. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> because they were so outspoken about issues of disobedience to the mm -hmm. Torah and seeking to bring people back to it that they became not so popular. Mm -hmm. People wanted to hear an easier message from the false prophets yes. and they didn't suffer. Like Jeremiah was thrown in a pit and uh, suffered a lot because people didn't like his message that we're going to Babylon yeah. because of what we've done. Or you can't keep trusting the temple to save you. And messages like that, uh, I can't imagine, you know, what would happen today if people were preaching in the church that uh, you can't trust just coming to church on Sunday to be the end of it. I mean, you got to, and uh, to get, you know, really particular about yes. what the Word of God says about how you live your life. Yeah ethically and what you do with your finances and things like that. I'm not sure how popular people would be. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, they, it was yeah. a tough calling to be a prophet. Yeah. Speaking of a tough calling, <laughs> Elijah, uh, one of the unwritten mm. prophets, lived at a time with Ahab, Jezebel, um, who was notorious for mm. s her support of Baal worship. Mm. Um, what would it have been like in Jezebel's time? Well, and, uh, <coughs> Jezebel uh, married uh, Ahab and uh, brought her Baalism, her worship of Baal, into the northern kingdom. And it was horrible. There were like, what, 400, I think, uh, prophets of Asherah, who was the female counterpart, wife and sister to Baal or to Baal. And then also uh, around 450 prophets of Baal, uh, or priests, I should say, priests, not prophets, but priests of Baal. And Elijah has to confront this. Now imagine that. Uh, and just to say a word about what Baalism was about. El in Canaanite religion, and we learned this from uh, Ugaritic uh, writings that were discovered at Ugarit. What we learn is that El was sort of like the granddaddy god. Underneath El was Baal, Baal, which meant master. And so describing the religious condition, uh, along with him was Anat, or Asherah. Now, Anat, basically, was the male deity, and Asherah, the female. They would often cut out of a tree a picture of a female figurine. And then there would be, we've discovered, or there's been discovered, uh, pictures of Baal throwing lightning down from heaven, causing the rains to come. It was a religion where you had professional prostitutes, uh, religious prostitutes, religious male and female prostitutes, and people would go in, as we had alluded to in Joshua, to worship Baal by having these sexual relations. And then Baal was to relate to Asherah, at that time and caused the rain to fall with the lightning and so forth. Uh, it was a fertility cult, a cult that had to do with pro sex and prosperity and also child sacrifice it was a horrible 
practice of Canaanitism. So that was all happening at this time in the Northern Kingdom uh, under Ahab and the cruel, cruel Jezebel. So that's the background. Uh, Elijah had to step into that background and be a prophet, which made it tough. And I mean, you can imagine that many uh, worsh worshipers of Baal, and then he has a hard message that Yahweh alone is God. Baal is a false god. And so that would lead then to his ministry. And that would have been just kind of the equivalent uh, a preacher going to, to Washington, D.C. and <coughs> confronting the, the, the powers that be with all of the nine or 850 uh, priests who, as I understand it, were all on the public payroll mm. and saying, you guys are all wrong. Um, I'm right. Yeah. And he was not well received. <laughs> Wouldn't have been well received. But the Lord set up kind of a showdown between Elijah and the, the opposite point of view. Mm. Could you describe that event? <laughs> yes. Uh, Elijah uh, basically called for a showdown, as you said, Rob, as to who is really God. If Baal is God, then let's worship him. If Yahweh is God, then we'll worship him. And so, first of all, uh, Elijah made a statement to Ahab and his house that there's not going to be any rain for three and a half years. Now, that's saying, like, your God can't do anything about it. My God, Yahweh, has already said, <laughs> Baal is going to be helpless. You're not going to have rain. But then, at the end of this time, uh, we're going to see who really is able to bring the rain. So there is that day when they build their different altars and the worshipers of Baal are cutting themselves and pleading for Baal to send the rain and the lightning, and it doesn't happen. And there's a little mockery. Maybe he's on a journey or something like this, or maybe he's you know, you sleep, you have to get his attention. And it's interesting that in the Ugaritic tablets, those things happen with Baal, things like that. So what is striking though, <laughs> is that Elijah finally then says, okay, we're going to see who, who really is Lord. And so he prays to Yahweh and lightning comes and rain comes and what Baal could not do, by the way, Baal just means master in Ugaritic. It's the same in Hebrew too, Baal means master. Uh, <laughs> so basically what Baal could not do, Yahweh did. Much like what we saw in Exodus, where the Lord is making a statement against all these other gods. Here, Yahweh is making a statement against the worship of Baal and uh, Asherah, and so forth. And so it's, it's a wonderful time of the elevation of the Lord. Of course, when all of that happened, he runs to herald this news and he learns that Jezebel's out to get him, as you say. <laughs> and then he becomes afraid mm -hmm. and he heads down to uh, the Judean uh, area where he would be out of the Northern Kingdom's territory and uh, he's ready to throw in the towel. And the Lord was not in the noise of, uh, of you know, uh, fire, lightning, all that. He was in a still small voice and he spoke to him. And he taught him that 7,000 had not bowed their knee to Baal because uh, he thought he was the only one left. Just sort of interesting, sometimes in the ministry, uh, as pastors, we can feel we're the only one left, you know, the whole world has gone to Baal or something. But that's not true. Mm -hmm. There's always 7,000 that haven't mm -hmm. bowed their knee to Baal. And so, yeah, Elijah is a wonderful, uh, can I say, defender of Yahwism, of Yahwehism, of worship of the Lord, 
Uh, I use Yahweh because that's a word that's often used, the yod He vav He, uh, the tetragrammaton, the four consonants. And uh, by the way, Yahweh could mean he causes to be, or it could be Yiveh, he is. We don't know how it was pronounced. But since Yahweh has become sort of the pronunciation, I think going back to Albright, uh, people today often speak of the name in those terms. Adonai is often substituted for yod heh vav -He, though, which would be the Lord or Master. Well, Elijah's ministry makes quite an impression, and he is joined and then followed by another prophet named Elisha. Mm. And Elisha's ministry takes a very different form from Elijah. Could you talk about Elisha a little bit? Yes. E Elijah, would you say, was more of the bombastic defender of Yahwehism. Elisha follows, and he has a double portion of Elijah's ministry. And his ministry is working sort of with people in a very personal way to illustrate the Lord's presence. Uh, remember the poisonous stew that uh, he, he brings healing to it. Uh, he makes bread multiply. He causes uh, the swimming of an, uh, like an ax in, in water. Um, it looks to me like it's more of incarnational in a uh, touching kind of way. He, Elijah did some of that too, but he raises a dead person, uh, a widow's uh, son who had died. So we begin to see more, and he, remember he talks to Nahum the leper mm -hmm. as to how he can have his sins forgiven uh, by washing in the Jordan, which he didn't want to do, which is interesting to me. It's sort of like today that Jesus is how we have our sins forgiven. Mm -hmm. Faith in him, and a lot of times people want a lot of other ways. Mm -hmm. So Jesus said though that I'm the one fulfilling the new covenant, opening the door uh, the way to have uh, your sins remitted. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, John 14. Beautiful, I think, application that we see here. So Elisha, though, was more of that personal touch. Becomes a type of our Lord, I think, uh, Rob. Elijah is a type of John the Baptist, whereas Elisha, a type of Jesus, who multiplies the bread, who touches people, who raises Lazarus, uh, does many of the same miracles that Elisha does, except in a greater way as the Son of God here upon earth. So I see those two as beautiful types of John the Baptist and of Jesus. One other thing I might say about Elijah and Elisha, Baal, was to do all of the things that Yahweh did. He was the God of the rain, the God of the lightning. He was the one who took care of widows. He was the one that uh, brought food and uh, grain to people, uh, cared for them. The one that's really doing this, though, is Yahweh. And so th there's a great defense here, sort of an apologia, an apologetic for the Lord in the Elijah-Elisha narrative. One other point about that whole section of uh, 2 Kings, what, 17 to, or 1 Kings 17 to 2 Kings 8, uh, where we have these oral prophets, is Elijah was caught up to heaven in a chariot of fire in chapter two of 2 Kings. And there were only two people in the Hebrew scriptures where that happened, and that was Enoch, who walked with the Lord in Genesis 5 and the Lord took him, and Elijah being caught up alive. And so he became a very important figure in later Jewish writing. You have the book of Enoch where Elijah uh, is communicating uh, ideas and, and so forth. So 
Um, just a point, and some have applied this to the church in the New Testament, that like Elijah will someday be caught up to meet the Lord, First Thessalonians 4, when, when he returns. So yeah. these are just interesting ideas or applications as we look at the Hebrew scriptures and then look at the New Testament. Well, on top of Elijah and Elisha, the, whose ministries were written down, but their messages were not so much, mm. uh, there's, there's a whole body of literature of <laughs> prophets who, um, who were written down. Mm. And uh, we're going to maybe take a look at each of those one by one here. Um, but before we look at any particular prophets, what role does this prophetic literature play in the overall canon of the Old Testament? Well, basically, I think prophetic literature <clears throat> is God's voice against idolatry, <clears throat> defending the Torah, at the same time anticipating the future, uh, talking about how God is going to judge because of disobedience to the Torah, in the exiles that take place. We learn that in Deuteronomy, that that would happen in the cursing section of Deuteronomy. But then there's a blessing section in, chapter th in Deuteronomy. And actually in chapters that we talked about when we did the Suzerainty Treaty, Rob, the blessings and cursing section of Deuteronomy 27 to 30, in the blessing section, there's the promise of restoring Israel and bringing her back to the land after the judgment, the ultimate judgment of captivity. You had locust invasion, you had things happening, then the ultimate would be captivity. Well, that, the prophets are announcing that, like Joel, locusts. Uh, the other prophets are announcing the captivity, like Jeremiah or Ezekiel or Isaiah. But at the same time, they're announcing restoration uh, so all of them will usually have two movements. One will be, here's the reason for judgment, and here's the judgment that's going to come, ultimate captivity, but the good news is, that's not the end of the story. Mm. The Lord's going to bring you back to the land, and he's going to bless you just like he promised in Deuteronomy. So their message was the explaining of what's going on in the judgment, and why, but at the same time, the comfort of the restoration that would come. While we're talking about the prophets, could I just say one word, <clears throat> Rob, I'm gonna move my coat here a minute. <clears throat> Getting, could I just say one word about how I see the prophets in terms of their order, or, or not their order, but their time in history. Mm -hmm. When I look at at this part of scripture, one of the things I've tried to do in my courses in teaching is outline the prophets around the time frame of <clears throat> what's going on. And if we start about 1050 to 931 BC, we have the kingdom period of Saul, David, and Solomon. Then in 931, we have the division taking place in second or in first kings chapter <clears throat> 12 and following to second kings 17 so the dates from there 931 bc go to 722 that's when assyria came in and took the northern kingdom captive described <clears throat> in uh, second kings 17 then we had uh, prophets prophesying during that period of time called the divided kingdom period of time. And I like to use a, sort of an acronym of Ja'im, Joel, Jonah, uh, Ja, Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, and Micah during that period of time, 931 to 722. And then 722 <clears throat> to 586 is the surviving kingdom period uh, where Judah, is surviving alone, the, 12, the 10 having been dispersed, 2 Kings 18 to 25. 
During that period, uh, Jaim Naz, Hajj, Nahum, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, and Jeremiah did their prophetic ministry, 722 to 586. Then the period of the exile, 586, actually starting 606, but where the first deportation starts, but let's say 586 to 536 or 537, however one dates it, the period of exile when they're in Babylon, Deo, <clears throat> I often think of the Latin, Deum, God, but Deo, Daniel, <clears throat> Ezekiel, and Obadiah, or Obadiah, during that period of time. Then, as they come back from 520 then, to 516, Haggai and Zechariah did their prophetic ministry. They were post-exilic. Mm -hmm. And then finally, Malachi, later on, somewhere, let's say, around 445 uh, B.C., Malachi. So that is a little chronology in Jaim, Naz, Hajj, Deo, and, and Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi, built around a date frame. In my uh, New T Old Testament survey, I have this around 12 periods. <clears throat> if students would be interested, Rob, of looking at it and trying to fit things together like a puzzle. How does this all fit mm -hmm. together time-wise? Yes. That's the purpose of that and everything. So I wanted to share that as we're beginning to talk about the prophets and their message. But I think they were the, the, linchpin, the linchpin, if I could use that, in describing the why or, or the, the, the need of judgment and the why of judgment, but then the consolation that would come afterwards, going back to the book of Deuteronomy, where you have that same theme talked about mm -hmm. in the cursing section and the blessing section of Deuteronomy. Moses had clearly warned them mm. how things would go if they were not remembering who they were and not listening to the Torah. Hey. And it, it clearly came down that way as they disobeyed the Lord raised up spokesmen to uh, pronounce those judgments and then, of course, eventually led them out of the end of the exile. Exactly. And if there's one term that defines the prophets, it's passion. Uh, Heschel talks about this in his writing on the prophets. Mm -hmm. Passion. That you see when you look at the prophets, a passion. And that's something that we need as pastors yeah. and teachers. We need passion in our teaching, in our preaching. It's not blasé, it's something that we feel passionate about. And I think we need passion as Christians about Christ and who yeah. he is and what he's done. And, and uh, it's, it's exciting, you know. And so passion is a word I think that, and I agree with Heschel, that captures yeah. uh, a lot of what the prophets are about. Well, let's begin to look at these prophets. Uh, these ones that we'll look at next are um, in the divided kingdom speaking to, mm. to Israel. And uh, let's start with the prophet Joel. Uh, what was his message to Israel? <coughs> and, um, and then how did the, the New Testament pick up those statements later? It's interesting. Uh, let me just say one word about the major and minor prophets. Mm, yes. Uh, Isaiah, uh, Yeshayahu, and Yeheskel, Ezekiel, Yermiyahu, Jeremiah were the major prophets, and Yoel, and on that we call the minor prophets, meaning they're smaller. Mm -hmm. In the Jewish uh, perspective, that's one book in the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, and Joel is a great prophet, just going back now to the Joel. I call Joel the locust book because in the first two chapters, Joel will deal with the locust plague. And that goes back to Deuteronomy again, <clears throat> where the Lord had promised that there'd be locusts. And he is prophesying to what appears to be the southern kingdom 
that there would be a plague of locusts. The locusts would plunder the land. The priests would be without, you know, they would have to fast and ask the Lord to, to do something about the locusts. Chapter 2 continues the image, I think, of locusts. Uh, like, like, it likens them to an invading force coming into the land and destroying and devastating everything in their path. But then, right in the midst of that, or I should say after that, we have a great text, uh, Rob, concerning the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And uh, so the first two chapters, down to the end of chapter 2, deal with locusts and the invasion of locusts. Now, if you would mind reading for us, beginning in chapter, uh, the end of chapter 2, about how the Lord is going to pour out his spirit and what that is going to mean, Rob. Starting with verse 28, And afterward I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said among the survivors whom the Lord calls. Notice the prophecy of Joel here is a wonderful prophecy a promise that he would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And notice your young men. Notice there's going to be a balance here. Uh, your sons and your daughters, male and female. Your old uh, men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Notice there's no age discrimination. And there's no, in my, th my thinking, there's no sexism here or ageism, or classism, because upon your servants, both male and female, in those days, I will pour out of my spirit, and there'll be signs. So I like to say, when I'm looking at this text, there's no sexism. Galatians 3 says there's no more male nor mm. female. There's no ageism. There's no more old versus young. And there's no more classism. And Acts 2, as we look at this text, as you had <coughs> mentioned, Rob, <coughs> Acts 2 is the fulfillment at Pentecost. When the Spirit is poured out, we have in the 120 up in the upper room, men and women, mm -hmm. both prophesying the great things of God. And in the early part of Luke, we have older Simeon and, and, and Anna, and then we had young Mary, and we had the older uh, Elizabeth. All of these f people together singing songs mm -hmm. and worshiping the Lord. And uh, so, and Zechariah. So what I see is that this is a critical point of the New Testament that happens at Pentecost. Christ had anticipated it in the four paraclete sections, meaning the, the, the comforter, the Holy Spirit he promised would come in the upper room discourse in chapters 13 through uh, 16. Uh, John said, I baptize with water, but shortly he will baptize with the Holy Spirit in Matthew chapter 3. And then in Acts 2, we see the outpouring of Joel uh, here. And so to me, this is a great text. Uh, if I could share with you my honest feeling, <laughs> I believe men and women equally prophesy. Uh, I don't see Genesis or Galatians 3 limited to just soteriology or salvation, mm -hmm. but including ecclesiology, mm -hmm. the church that I, it's my conviction that men and women both are now, since Pentecost, co-laborers yes. in the proclamation of the Lord's word. We need everyone.
proclaiming. And one of the tragedies, if I could just apply it a little bit here, Rob. In our culture today, we have the older church and the younger church. And I think that's sad, sad in a lot of ways. I believe Joel is speaking of old and young together working. And that's something that I think pastors need to work on mm -hmm. rather than simply saying, let the older people go by themselves and the younger ones over here. That's going along with culture, but it's not a biblical idea that we find in Joel. So to me, this is, has a tremendous application, especially for the New Testament church mm -hmm. as we look at Pentecost and Joel chapter two. And then, of course, the book concludes with further reference to the ingathering of the exiles and uh, basically the struggle that will take place before the end occurs. So those are the themes of the book of Job. Locus, the pouring out of the spirit, the final ingathering, and final judgment uh, is the way I would see these short, uh, this short, wonderful book. Let's look at Jonah. Um, Jonah is another example of a prophet who's running from the Lord. And um, let's look at his story and what mm -hmm. was going on in that book. It's interesting. The Lord tells Jonah to go to Nineveh. And uh, he gives him a commission. But Jonah doesn't want to go, <laughs> right? So he catches a ship in the opposite direction. And uh, because of that, the Lord sends a large fish to swallow Jonah. And in the belly of the fish, we have his prayer in chapter two. And finally, he gets the point. <laughs> the Lord wants him to carry out this commission uh, a lot of times people have told me in the ministry they felt called and they denied it. They went in another direction. Mm -hmm. But the Lord later got their attention. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're seeing this <laughs> here. And by the way, the reason he didn't want to go, in my understanding, was that he did not want to see God have mercy on the Ninevites, on Assyria. Assyria, they were brutal. I mean, they would do horrible things in their, when they would overtake another people. And so the last thing in the world he would want would be forgiveness. And he knew that if he went and they repented that God would forgive them. And he didn't want that. <laughs> and so in chapters three and four, we have the recommissioning. And finally, after coming out of the fish's belly, he, which I take to be literal, historical in my own understanding of it, not a parable, but a, right. a reality, yes. that basically he then goes to Nineveh <laughs> and he preaches, and lo and behold, they repent. Now here's a prophet that's angry. <laughs> I mean, you would think if you had a revival, you'd be excited, <laughs> but he's not excited at all. And the Lord is teaching him a lesson there is a word in Hebrew that keeps reappearing mean, meaning he prepares things. He prepared a fish. And then he prepared uh, like a, a, a plant that would cover him, give him shade. Then he prepared a worm that would eat. I mean, all the way through, the, the, there's the book is building around this, this word mean, meaning the verb to prepare. And so he's really enjoying the shade for a while the sun is blocked for a moment, but then the worm comes and eats the, uh, that plant at the bottom of it, so it withers. And the heat starts pouring on him, and he's mad. And the Lord says, well, you know, are you upset? And he says, I am very upset. And uh, the reason he's upset is because the very thing that he thought God would do, he did. And that is, he showed mercy. And Rob, if you could read that, it's a great section, beginning at verse four, I'm, I'm sorry, chapter four, 
and following. Where do you want me to start? Uh, verse 1 of okay. chapter 4. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. <laughs> yeah, notice this is beautiful. He said, I knew that you were El Hanun, Verachum, that you were a merciful and compassionate, long, Eric uh, Payim, long of nose. In other words, I think long time before your nose got red mm. in anger, that you were, that your anger was, it took a long time for it to happen. And so you were very much, uh, you were slow to anger is the idea. You were gracious, you were merciful, slow to anger. Rav Chesed, uh, you were abundant in loyal love or in kindness, famous word in the Hebrew Bible, Chesed. Mm. And you relent or repent, repent from evil. I knew that. Now take my life. I don't want these Assyrians to have that. And so this is where the Lord then prepares. Uh, if you would just read that, the uh, continuing verse 4 and following Rob. The Lord replied, have you any right to be angry? Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. Interesting in the Hebrew, Vayaman Adonai Elohim. Ki, ki kayon, whatever that, we're not sure exactly, maybe like a huge plant that, that covered him a kikayon plant, and he prepared. This is where we get that same verb mean. Uh, so he prepared this plant, and it was giving him shade. And then, notice what happens. God prepared a worm. In the next verse, Rob. Vayaman ha'elohim tola'at. And the worm came and uh, ate, uh, smote the, the, the uh, kiki, kikayon plant, and it withered. And the sun began to beat down on Jonah. And so Jonah is upset. And if you could read on, Rob, beginning uh, at verse 8 and following. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind. And the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. There we have that same verb again, vayaman. And it's the same one about the whale. Right? So, so certainly... Jonah is building, the book is being built around how God prepares things to teach the prophet about his <laughs> gracious nature. And then if you would continue, Rob. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said. I am angry enough to die. But the Lord said, you've been concerned about this vine Though you did not tend it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? What a beautiful mm. summary. In other words, he was more concerned about his own comfort, <laughs> where the Lord was concerned about all these people that if they repented, and they repented, so he showed his mercy. Repentance is the basis of having the Lord's mercy, I think the book is teaching, but also teaching that the Lord takes pleasure in bringing deliverance even to Israel's arch evil enemy and the Assyrians. And so uh, there's a lesson here, I think, for pastors and churches that often we become more comfortable in what we're used to in the church and our own comfort. And when new people come in, maybe they don't fit into that uh, comfort zone. And so people can get upset. And yet the Lord wants to, to work and save people. 
and bring salvation, bring his love to them. But sometimes people can be more excited about uh, what you paint a room in a church than about new people that come in that maybe they're the ones you don't want in. They're from the other side of the tracks or something yes, like that. Right. So, but here's the goyim too, the Gentiles. And not just Gentiles, but the ones that uh, were very hurtful to Israel that the Lord is now pitting when there's repentance. And yes. so I think that's, I think we're seeing the heart of the Lord here in, yes. in Jonah. Yes. And by the way, while, before we leave Jonah, Jonah also, Christ alludes to Jonah in Matthew 12, as Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, so much the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. So Jonah becomes a type of Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. And by the way, three days and three nights in the Jewish idea, any part of a day is considered mm -hmm. a day. So yes. I think that's what Jesus is saying, but he's using uh, the book of Jonah, especially chapter two, as a type of his own uh, burial and resurrection. Beautiful, beautiful message and beautiful book. Yes, and I think in some ways it's a, it's a reminder that the, the, the leaders of Israel need to remember that God's Abrahamic covenant includes all people mm. and not just the, the special chosen Jewish ones. Exactly. In you, all nations will be blessed. Yes. And we're seeing that worked out even in the Hebrew scriptures. Yes. Anticipating Galatians 3, in Christ, all nations are blessed. Because It's my thinking that Christ was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, Revelation 12 and that we were chosen, the church was chosen in Christ before the foundation yes. of the world, Ephesians 1. So in light of that, Christ is the basis of, and his agreement between the Father and the Son, that he would provide that sacrifice from yes. all eternity. I believe we're seeing glimpses of how that Abrahamic promise of 12.3 of Genesis is now being carried out and going to be carried out and it's because of Christ and what he uh, had agreed to do from all eternity and what he f fulfilled, can we say, in his atoning death. Yes, that eternal perspective we begin to see coming together here, especially in the time of the, the prophets and this time in Jonah is a very good place where it's clear yes. to us. And that, that word in Jonah that he, um, what did you say he provided? Uh, yeah, uh, via mean, uh, from the root mean. He prepared. Yeah, he prepared for he, mean, yeah. He, he sees, he knows the eternal plan and he's working to unfold that merciful compassion. Even now, Rob, yeah, yeah absolutely. And we're nations. seeing it right here, that preparation, that working, that's because of Christ yes. that that's possible. Yes. We believe as Christians. As we move to the next prophet, um, Amos, um, another function of the prophets, and of course we see that in Christ too, is he pronounces um, criticism, constructively mm. aimed criticism, um, chastens and disciplines mm. when things are not right. And that's a, a big part of the, the book of Amos. Can mm. you talk about Amos? Yes, Amos, is the prophet of social justice, many have said. Uh, I call Joel the locust book, to capture the theme uh, for students. Jonah the whale book, but more than the whale book, the mm. book of God's grace. Amos, or Amos, the cowboy turned preacher book. Uh, Amos was a boker. He uh, was piercing sycamore fruit to see if it was ripe, and he enjoyed that, but the Lord called him to be a prophet. And basically, <clears throat> he's mainly a prophet to the Northern Kingdom, uh, but in chapters one and two, he announces judgment against the nations surrounding Israel, primarily, Rob, <coughs> for their violence <coughs> and what they did. And I remember 
studying this a long time ago, thinking that in the first two chapters, he's starting like this with the surrounding nations, mm -hmm. and then Israel would be clapping, you yes. know, go after them, Amos, go after Damascus, <laughs> go after Tyre, <laughs> amen, go after Edom and Ammon <laughs> and Moab. And uh, then all of a sudden, he comes like this, and he said, and you guys are guilty too. Uh, he comes to Judah and the sins of Israel uh, being a very, very ungrateful nation and the sins of Judah for not keeping the Lord's Torah. And so it's, I like to see it like this. And then, you know, that, that's what he's doing as a prophet. So the message to the surrounding nations is their violence and what they're doing. Then to Judah and Israel, it's they've sinned in not keeping the, the law and not keeping the Torah. So that's how the book begins. And then beginning in chapter 3 through uh, chapter uh, 7, well actually through chapter, uh, yes, through chapter 7 or chapter 6, I should say, we have we have basically three messages. And you begin in, in 3, 1, Shem'u et hadavar hazeh. Hear this word. And then he goes and begins to describe God's judgment on the northern kingdom <coughs> and the, the why of that judgment and what they're doing to be wrong. And then beginning in 4, Shem'u hadavar hazeh. Hear this word, the second message, cows of Bashan. Uh, by the way, you don't call the ladies cows of Bashan. That's what he did. That's why he wasn't popular. Because you're oppressing the poor. You're crushing the destitute. You say, bring us more that we can drink. So you're sending your husbands out to City Hall to enact laws that would hurt the poor so you can get richer. And so that's, you know, Bashan was an area where you had sleek cattle and they would graze and they were, they were big. And so not that the ladies were necessarily fat or overweight, but they were getting fat off of the, uh, can I say, the poor and what their husbands were doing in the courtroom uh, at that time. So he, <laughs> he speaks to that. And then he goes on to talk about God's judgment, and we have the next message in 5, Shem'u et hadavar hazeh. Hear the word. There you have your three messages and how he is speaking most of the time about justice issues. While the rich are living in luxury, the poor are suffering. And uh, that's why he's the prophet of social justice, has gained that uh, title, really. And I spoke of him as like a cowboy turned preacher. Uh, so God is going to come and judge them. What he wants more than anything else is for justice to flow and justice to be realized. And over and over, uh, over and over, that is the theme of what we have uh, in the book of Amos. Look with me for just a moment, if you could read chapter 6, Rob, uh, beginning at, uh, actually at verse uh, 3, if you would. You put off the evil day and bring near a reign of terror. You lie on beds inlaid with ivory, and lounge on your couches. You dine on choice lambs and fattened calves. You strum away on your harps like David and improvise on musical instruments. You drink wine by the bowlful and use the finest lotions, but you do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, you will be among the first to go into exile. Your feasting and lounging will end. So basically, this is what he's doing. I mean, they're, they're, they're living it up in luxury, rather than doing what the Lord wants, which is justice. 
He wants justice to flow like a mighty river and for it to be realized, but this is not happening. And so he's addressing the northern kingdom as to what they need to do and be like if they're going to please the Lord. And then let's go on into seven. He then has a series, can we say, Rob, of uh, visions, five visions that the Lord relents or repents of, a swarm of locusts. Uh, he has the vision of a devouring fire in chapter 7, of a plumb line where the building is not lining up like it should. Mm -hmm. And that then means that there needs to be judgment coming because of that. And in the midst of that, of these uh, five visions, Amos is confronted by Amaziah, the priest of the northern kingdom, who says, hey, Amos, you're not wanted around here. You're not winning people to your side at all. So go back south. We don't want you up here in the north. And I always get amused at uh, the answer that Amos gives. And if we could pick that up uh, at verse 15 of chapter 7, Rob, that would be good. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Now then, hear the word of the Lord. You say, Do not prophesy against Israel and stop preaching against the house of Isaac. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. Your wife will become a prostitute in the city, and your sons and daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be measured and divided up, and you yourself will die in a pagan country, and Israel will certainly go into exile away from their native So land. he had a hard message yeah. uh, when he was told not to prophesy. And right before that, uh, Amos replies to Amaziah, who doesn't want him to prophesy and says, I'm not a prophet. I'm not even the son of a prophet. I'm a boker. I'm a cattle herder. I'm, I'm, I'm like a, a cowboy. <laughs> and I didn't want this job in the first place. I was happy to look at the sycamores and examine them. But God called me to prophesy. He said, go prophesy. Let me just say this, in the ministry a lot of times, the most important thing we can do is know that if God's called us to be faithful. Yes. Pastors at times may find that what they say may not be appreciated, especially if they teach the word, mm -hmm. but that's the call of a prophet. And Amos said, I didn't even want this, but it's a divine call, right? Mm -hmm. Jeremiah didn't yeah. want, but it's a divine call. So the call to preach needs to be not a job choice, yes. but it's a divine call to be a prophet. Yes. And I think this is important in Amos. So he continues the vision of uh, rotten fruit. Uh, actually, in chapter 8, the Lord showed him a basket of summer fruit. Very interesting in the Hebrew, kaluv kayets. And then he said, the end has come. Uh, from the basket of kaluv kayets, uh, has come the hakates, the end. So you can see a lot of play in Hebrew uh, here, and that happens a lot in the prophets, where you'll have a word repeated with the same sound for literary assonance mm -hmm. or literary effect. So he has this vision of, of uh, can I say, summer fruit that has now become old, and the end has come. And then finally, the smitten lentil the vision against the temple, which is the final judgment to come. But you know, Amos being a prophet of social justice, it doesn't stop there. He concludes by showing that there's a future day coming when the tabernacle of David will be rebuilt. And if you could read that uh, for me, um, that, would, that would be great. Starting right. with verse that's, 11. That's a verse 11, uh-huh. In that day I will restore David's fallen tent. I will repair its broken places, restore its ruins, and build it as it used to be, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom 
And all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. So the Lord's going to change things, and there's going to be a bountiful future that's talked about in the days to come, when the plowman will meet the reaper and the treader of grapes, will meet the one who carries the seed, and on and on. The mountains will drip with uh, sweet juice, so to speak. And so he sees this time of prosperity when the tab tabernacle of David that's fallen will be rebuilt. And this, as we look at the New Testament in Acts 15, is quoted, this very text, in the building up of the church uh, and the beautiful application that even the Goyim, the Gentiles, are a part of that in Acts chapter 15. So Amos is the prophet that wants justice to flow like a mighty river and uh, the prophet of social justice. Though these prophets declare faithfully the word of the Lord, um, quite often they're not listened to. Mm. And uh, the Lord's heart is, is broken by, mm. the, by the failures of his people and uh, the tragedies that those failures lead to. Um, Hosea is kind of a heartbreaking book. Mm. And uh, I was wondering if you could kind of unpack that story for us. A wonderful, wonderful book too. I call Hosea the bad marriage book because in the first three chapters, Hosea is to marry Gomer, who becomes an unfaithful wife. <clears throat> and he's to have children by her called Lo Ami, not my people, and Lo Ruchama, not pity. And then later on, after all of this takes place, she becomes unfaithful. She goes after other lovers. He then is to woo her back and bring her back in spite of that. This becomes a beautiful illustration of Yahweh and Israel. The Lord is wedded to Israel, but Israel becomes unfaithful. She goes after the Baal, after Baal, because he gives grain and everything and leaves the relationship with the Lord. So Hosea's life becomes a parable or an illustration, can we say? An illustration would be a better word. An illustration of Yahweh and Israel. And later on, lo ami will be ami. Not my people will be my people. And lo ruchama, not pitied, will be ruchama, pitied, the, the, the uh, daughter. So it's looking at how Israel is going to depart from the Lord and yet the Lord is going to bring her back and redeem her. And then beginning in four, through the uh, end of the book, we have the reason why she has become a prostitute, that is Israel. And it's all about her unfaithfulness, what she's done, and how she has departed from her husband, from the Lord. So what Hosea goes through uh, Israel, uh, or excuse me, the Lord is going through. One of the things that's striking, though, in the midst of this, in chapter 11, we have a wonderful text that Matthew applies in Matthew chapter 2 from a Christological typical application. And um, if you could just read that in 11 verse 1, and uh, that would be great, Rob. Matthew 11. Verse 1. Uh -huh. Verse 1. When Israel was a child, that, that particular verse. Verse 1 and 2, I guess we could say. Of Hosea 11. Oh, Hosea 11. Oh. I went to Matthew, sorry Okay, about that. I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. Uh, the, the text I was thinking about, Ki na'ar Yisrael, when Israel was a child, mm. then I loved him, v'ohavehu umimitzrayim karat 
Karate Livni. And from Egypt I called my son. I was thinking of that one, Rob. And then in Matthew, Matthew applies that to Christ as, can we say, the final Israel who is not disobedient but obedient. And as Israel was called out of Egypt, so Christ was called out of Egypt Egypt as the final perfect representation of what Israel should have been but was not, but he then becomes. And I think Matthew is seeing this typologically as a type of our Lord Jesus Christ coming out of Egypt. Then the book of Hosea goes on, continues to talk about Ephraim or Israel's disobedience, but concludes with the final exaltation, deliverance, and uh, we pick that up. There's the appeal to repentance followed in chapter uh, 13 or chapter 14, beginning at verse 5. And if you could read, read that uh, for us, Rob, that would be great. I will be like the dew to Israel. He will blossom like a lily, like a cedar of Lebanon. He will send down his roots. His young shoots will grow. His splendor will be like an olive tree his fragrance like a cedar of Lebanon. Men will dwell again in his shade. He will flourish like the grain. He will blossom like a vine, and his fame will be like the wine from Lebanon. O Ephraim, what more have I to do with idols? I will answer him and care for him. I am like a green pine tree. Your fruitfulness comes from me. Who is wise? He will realize these things. Who is discerning? He will understand them. The ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but the rebellious stumble in them. Isn't that a beautiful conclusion, Mm -hmm. Rob? All the prophets always conclude with the promise of restoration. And so Israel is to be restored in spite of the northern kingdom's rebellion becoming like Gomer. Someday she will be Ami, my people. Uh, in, in Romans chapter 11, it speaks of a day when all Israel will be saved. Mm. And uh, it seems that that's teaching that there will be a recognition at the time, many believe, of the return of Christ when there will be a great uh, revival mm. of turning to Jesus as the Messiah on the part of Israel and fulfilling some of these great promises that we're reading about Mm -hmm. in a book like Hosea. There's one more small book we're going to look at today, and that's the book of Micah. Mm. What uh, can we as Christians glean from this book? Yeah, Micah, Micha, a wonderful little book. Uh, I call Micah, Jaim, uh, Isaiah is the major uh, and I call the Shakespeare of the Old Testament. Micah is like little Isaiah, okay. or little Shakespeare. Uh, very classically written in Hebrew. Uh, first of all, we start off with judgment on Judah in the first three chapters. So the first three are dealing primarily with judgment. The false prophets are being exposed, and uh, the rulers of what they're doing wrong Uh, and uh, how they're misleading uh, the prophets and what the prophets are doing, the corruption that's going on in Judah now in these first three chapters. Then in chapters four and five, we have a little, what we might call eschatological section in the middle of that. It reads a lot like what we have in uh, Isaiah chapter 11. we see, for example, what the world is to become like, according to Micah, and that's in chapter 4. Uh, if you could read just a little bit of that um, in chapter 4, the first part of that, that would be great, Rob, beginning at 4, verse 1. In, the, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, 
to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between many people and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war any more. Every man will sit under his own vine and under his own fig tree, and no one <coughs> will make them afraid, for the Lord Almighty has spoken. Beautiful section, isn't it? And uh, I, I'd said 11 of Isaiah, chapter 2 of Isaiah has very similar mm -hmm. uh, anticipation. Some will take this quite literally, that uh, during the future millennium, this will take place in Palestine. Others take it as a sort of a prophetic statement about a new heaven and new earth that will take place uh, after Christ returns uh, and after the final judgment. So the beauty of this though is that it's a promise of future restoration of peace, of prosperity, and all the prophets have those sections in them. But then in the midst of this, Micah has a wonderful little statement about coming out of Bethlehem would be the Messiah, we believe. We as Christians, anyway, believe yes. that. And if we could read in 5.1 and following, Rob. Marshal your troops, O city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Yes. And so when we look at this text, Bethlehem, Beit Lechem, is where the Messiah, we believe, uh, will be born and in the New Testament in Matthew when the wise men came to Christ to see him they came to Bethlehem and we're told and they said to him in Bethlehem of Judea for thus it is written through the prophets they inquire and the scholars make a statement as to where Messiah would be born and you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, although you are least among the governors of Judah, out of you will come the governor who will shepherd my people Israel. So Matthew applies this very text in Micah to the Lord and to his origins in Bethlehem. And so what a beautiful Christological application of Micah 5 here and then as we move into six and seven, he comes back, Rob, to the area of further, can I say, judgment and encouraging the people to live out mm -hmm. the Torah. There is a very, very beautiful statement in chapter six about what, the, what Israel is to be like, what they're to look like, in their relationship to the Lord. And uh, if you would read beginning at verse 6 there uh, of chapter 6. With what mean. shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? <laughs> shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression? the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. He has showed you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Isn't that a beautiful text? In other words, what the Lord really wants is not just religious worship, uh, but what he really wants is for you to do these things the doing, mishpat, uh, or, or uh, asot, im asot mishpat, if you do that which is just. The ahava, the ahavad chesed, and the loving of loyal love or kindness. And then walking in a humble way with your God. 
what a beautiful, beautiful summary. Uh, you know, he doesn't want 10,000 uh, streams of oil or thousands of rams. He wants you and your heart and to be kind and to live out loving your neighbor as yourself in a humble way. That's one of the great things that Micah presents to us. And then he continues with the theme of judgment followed, can we say again, by restoration. And we see that in verses 18 to the end of chapter 7. And if you could read that, Rob, that would be great. Which verse again? Uh, verse 18, verse 18. Uh, through the end of the chapter. Who mm -hmm. is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depth of the sea. You will be true to Jacob and show mercy to Abraham as you pledged on oath to our fathers in the days long ago. What a beautiful conclusion. Yeah. So all the prophets will finish on a positive note of the Lord restoring his people, bringing forgiveness, um, casting their sins into the depths of the sea. I remember as a boy singing the song about Gone, 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 gone. Yes, my sins are gone. Yes. Buried in what? The depths of the sea. Yes. And this would come out of a text yes. like this. And so Amos, although a little book, gives us many, many, uh, can I say, classic moments uh, to reflect upon. It's good to see that these little snippets, many of which are picked up in the New Testament, are rooted in that ancient history in Israel that, that the Lord knew the plan that he had from the beginning Absolutely. and has very carefully prepared it and unfolded it over the years. Absolutely. It's wonderful. We're going to look at one more book today, um, mm. and that's, of course, the Shakespeare, as you said, mm. of the Old Testament, mm. Isaiah. Um, what was the, the primary thrust at the time of Isaiah's message? Well, the primary thrust of Isaiah, uh, if you look at the book, actually it divides itself up into several sections. Uh, you could almost say 1 to 39 is the first part, 40 to 66 is the second. And what he does, he deals with Israel, uh, especially primarily with the kingdom of Judah, uh, to encourage them again, like the other prophets, to obey the Torah, to, to be faithful. He doesn't want just religious ritual, as we've seen in Micah. We see that in Isaiah 1. Uh, he communicates at a time, especially with Ahaz, uh, in that struggle with the northern kingdom uh, invading Judah, Pekah and Ratzin, uh, Pika of the northern kingdom, Retzin, of up in Syria at that time, invading uh, Judah. And then the temptation to, uh, the reason they were doing that is because they wanted him to form an alliance against Assyria. It's in the midst of that that he ministers and prophesies about a child being born. And we'll talk about that in a moment, about how that will point, I think, typically, fi finally, to Christ. Uh, so he, he ministered with kings. He ministered to uh, Hezekiah, for example, in 36 through uh, and following to 39. He had a ministry to describe to Hezekiah how he was going to live, even though mm -hmm. he thought he was going to die, and ministered to him. He also ministered to the, about the nations surrounding Israel, especially chapters 13 and following through 20, I believe. He's ministering to the nations surrounding Israel. All the prophets have messages for the nations. He also has a futuristic emphasis. 
especially in chapters 24 to 27. He'll talk about the future, what the Lord's going to do and bring salvation to Israel, to his people, and there'll be resurrection. And we've been grafted into that, which through Christ, which is a beautiful section. He'll talk about Egypt and how the Lord's going to judge Egypt in Isaiah 30 and 31. Uh, then again, there's a section after all of this, especially from 40 on, which he talks about restoration after the Babylonian captivity. And some will want to see a second Isaiah there. I personally see Isaiah predicting that as though the exile has occurred and he's predicting what the Lord's going to do, how he's going to bring Israel out of Babylon and deliver them through Cyrus, the Persian. And I'm of the opinion that uh, Isaiah is writing that prior to even the birth of Cyrus, which I would see as a supernatural endowment that the Lord gave uh, Isaiah to know even the name of the Persian king mm -hmm. that would be used as the deliverer. So I personally don't follow a second Isaiah at that point in the time of the exile, but Isaiah writing can I say in the seventh uh, century BC in a miraculous way about how s the Persian would be used to affect that deliverance. And then he moves on to talk about even the future after that, which brings us to Christ, especially Isaiah 53, and we'll talk about that shortly, but the beauty of that text. And then on again, finally, with great moments of encouragement to that generation that would be in captivity coming out, uh, especially 40, how beautiful that is, but leading forward to Messiah, to Christ, and what he would accomplish, and then ultimately, while giving warning of further idolatry, to stay away from it, pointing to a new heaven and new earth, especially in Isaiah 64 and 66, so it's a beautiful book dealing with all of these variant themes. We could say the two ideas, though, would be judgment and deliverance out of captivity, moving into the future and into even uh, the time of our Lord and to a new heaven and new earth.